Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you specifically on this day for our fathers. And you as our Heavenly Father, you have been the Father to many who have not known their earthly father. And we thank you for that as well. We thank you for being in our midst. And we ask in this, in this time that you would come in a special way. That you would help remove distractions. That as we look at your word, we could see it in the context that we're supposed to see it in. That we could understand your truths and how to properly apply them to our lives. We know your word says that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so now we ask that you would use this word to change us so that we leave this place more like you than when we came in the door. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, for those of you that weren't here last week, that image is going to be weird. I'll get to that in just a second. After we finished Acts, uh, our world kind of went upside down. So I intended on going into James, but, and we will get there, but as I looked at what was going on in our world, we saw, uh, we saw murder. And I know I'm being blunt there uh, because I, I can use, I was trained in how to use that restraint, and that was an intentional misuse of, of a restraint. It's not supposed to go on the neck. And we saw George Floyd pass away, uh, and we saw him murder. And this led to a series of riots. And so as the world has gone crazy, we've paused and we've gone and looked back at what I really think are basics, but I don't think that our world knows them the way that they should. And so we began with anger, and yes, we learned that biblically, yes, you can be angry, but we need to respond to that anger with our minds and not just with emotions. We need to think about what we're doing so that we don't do something inappropriate. And then last week we discussed judgment, and we learned, yes, scripturally, yes, we can judge, and that's where this comes in, right? This is the the story of not judging hypocritically from the famous passage that begins, judge not. Well, don't worry about the speck in your brother's eye when you have a beam in your own eye. So we're to not judge hypocritically or surface level. We're to make what we often call discernments. We need to decide and determine what's true, what's not. We may even need to determine that someone is in sin. But that doesn't, on the, on the other side, doesn't give us uh, an opportunity to sentence them to their eternal judgment. We are going to be involved in the sentencing of angels we saw last week. But while we're here, we should desire that each person around us receives the grace that we have received as Christians. But kind of connected to that, there's this idea of accountability. Because here in this image you see one brother, even though he's flawed here, trying to help out another. And so we're going to go in that kind of direction today. We're going to talk about accountability and how appropriate it is that we talk about accountability on Father's Day. Because for many of us, our father was the first person that really held us accountable and called us out when we did something wrong. And so I really appreciate my father, and I hope that you can appreciate this kind of humor here because my kids might hopefully don't do that, but they've done stuff uh, that have similarly frustrated me. We, we see in our children the opportunity to mold and model and just this, this little life and guide them and shoot them in the right direction. And that involves accountability. It involves occasionally saying, I told you to do this. You did something different. We got to talk about it. You're in trouble. And that, that's part of molding and making our child, right, and into the adult that they need to be. Now, I know we use the phrase raising children, but I hope if there are other parents here, the idea is that we're raising our children to be adults. We want them to launch out and be successful and not just stay children forever. And so, Maybe they'll do something a little crazy and they need a little guidance and direction. Well, we too as Christians, we need some guidance and direction from time to time. So we're going to begin with Proverbs 27.5. Better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. It goes on later in the chapter to to say perhaps something a little more famous or more well-known. Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Now, an open rebuke, we don't often think about that term. In fact, the last time I heard that term, I'll be honest, it was used by a a Christian who was saying that he rebuked another Christian uh, about something that, honestly, the guy doing the rebuking was completely wrong on. And and so it becomes this Christianese word in in the southern Bible Belt area where I grew up. Sometimes it became a fiery old-timer word where they would use it to, you know, I'm rebuking you for the, using the, you know, something besides the King James. And so even as a Christian, I kind of have a negative connotation of this word, right? Because I encountered folks that were using it. So let me put it in clear and plain English. 
A rebuke is clearly, unequivocally telling someone that they are wrong about something. And that's, it involves really essentially constructive criticism. We see an initial couplet in the Proverbs where we use the word rebuke. When we see a little bit later in Proverbs here in that, in that same chapter, in verse 17, a call about sharpening one another. So there is some constructive criticism. It is not just simply tearing someone down or name-calling or launching out or using that biblical word to, to shame someone. If you think about it in the terms of a castle, if, if someone was visiting a, a, another castle and they saw a weak point where the defenses could be breached, rebuking is not simply attacking that weak point. Rebuking is saying, hey friend, I noticed a weak point here where the walls could come tumbling down. We need to address that and possibly even helping them address it, being a part of that repair or that reconstruction. So it's not just a simple attack. And it's contrasted here with things that are openly sweet, things that are nice. I quoted this last week and I got to quote it again. When you want to help people, you tell them the truth. When you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. That's Thomas Sowell, an economist, very famous economist. The Bible warns about flattery, and a rebuke or ironing, sharpening iron is the exact opposite of this. Uh, a flattery is just telling people what they want to hear to make them like you, or to get something out of them, or to manipulate the conversation in a certain way. And, and about that, that verse, um, about ironing, sharpening iron, Bill Cravens is a metallurgical engineer and a blogger. And so I want to address that verse because I, we've struggled to interpret that verse properly because if you take modern day iron and additional iron it's not going to sharpen so don't try that with with modern day iron but unlike gold and silver uh, iron what we call iron actually rarely occurs in nature and it's it's uh, iron oxide and what gives it its strength is the carbon content inside of it uh, and ancient metal workers figured out how forging and refolding iron tools could make them stronger but they had to be careful too much carbon in the mix that made the, uh, with the iron, it made them brittle. So at the time, if they had brittle parts of it, they would scrape off the brittle parts to get to the softer core of the iron and maybe try again. And so that was where the origin of the phrase seems to have ar ar arisen from. But that means that it's painful sometimes. One of the most beautiful pictures, and one of the things that still to this day, if I, if I sit down and read it, is going to make me cry, is in the Chronicles of Narnia, when Eustace, if you know who this boy I'm talking about is, Eustace Scrub was a little terrible child. And when he came into Narnia in the third book, uh, in the Dawn Treader, he became a dragon. And he saw what he really was the whole time. And the Jesus figure in the books that C.S. Lewis wrote was Aslan. And Aslan shows up, and to heal Eustace, to get him back to being a boy, he takes his lion's claws and he rips and tears at that dragon's flesh. It's not a picture we think about when we think about Jesus transforming us, tearing at us, hurting us, and wounding us in a way. But the process of becoming who God wants us to be can indeed be very difficult and very painful. And that's very different than what Paul tells Timothy, that in the end times there'll be people who want to just have people tickle their ears. They're going to draw together teachers that tell them what they want as opposed to what they need to hear. Uh, every now and then I will see books that are, or art news articles that say things your pastor wants to tell you but won't because he gets fired. Well, I don't really read a lot of those because I just say those anyways. That's my personality. I just pull out my broadsword and charge at it is the way that I, I've come to determine that. I'm, I'm a little blunt. And, and I understand, though, that there are times when people have to put things delicately. And I also understand that sometimes when you tell the truth, people will get mad at you for it because we don't do well at separating the message from the messenger. And so we have these issues, and the world knows this as well. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to use a popular cultural um, phenomenon. I grew up before the prequel era, uh, the prequel era of Star Wars. And so I grew up with just the classics, with Darth Vader and Luke and Han and Chewie, and, and that was Star Wars to me. And as I learned, you guys know I'm a little bit nerdy, as I learned the background of those movies, I found out 
that George, George Lucas' original pitch for Star Wars included characters like Mace Windy and a guy named Starkiller. All the designs were radically different. Uh, Leia and Han were not a couple, and at one point Han was going to die. It was very different. But an artist named Ralph McQuarrie came along, and he turned the designs into what you really see today, or at least closer to them. And his first wife really helped with the story and did a ton of re-editing on the first movie. And so that's why we got some of those masterpieces. But then when I was in high school, the prequels came out. And I don't know, for my generation or for, for people that really like the original Star Wars, they went and saw the prequels, and George Lucas got to do whatever he wanted on those. They didn't tell him what was, you know, they didn't stand up to him because he was the guy who made all the money. He was the boss. There was no creative consulting. There was no constructive criticism. And what did we get? We got Jar Jar. So for those of you who are not Star Wars fans, I'm sorry for that aside, but I wanted to, to let you know that even in the creative world, even in the secular world, we know that constructive criticism and working on each other can sharpen one another, can help us get to something better. We don't and we shouldn't operate in a bubble because if we do, we're kind of writing our own story in life. And if we go off the script that God has for us, if we don't take the corrections and guidance that we should receive and we don't take it seriously, the finished script of our own life, that finished journey, could look something like something way worse than it should have had we taken the constructive feedback. And there is another phrase, uh, Irish po poet uh, and a playwright, Oscar Wilde says, true friends stab you in the front. And it's that same idea, faithful are the wounds of a friend. We need those moments where people tell us the truth. They need to tell us, now maybe it's as small as you got broccoli stuck in your teeth, or maybe it's something bigger, hey, you're in sin. And so we need these moments to help correct us. So we're going to look at Galatians, which is our main text for this morning. And we're actually going to be in Galatians 2 for the majority of the time. But I want to look at Galatians 3 first because I want to explain what Paul here is doing when he's writing to the Galatian church. A church, by the way, that in Acts 16 that we saw him found. So keep that in mind when he's harsh with them, as he will be. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Galatians 3, 2 here. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now, I know verses were added much later. I emphasize that point to you. But man, with questions like that, I just I enjoy a nice pause as they were reading. And so I want to ask it again. And I want you to internally answer the question. Did you receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit? Did you get saved by the works of the law? Did you get saved by things that you could do or by hearing and responding with faith? Hearing that message of grace. How were you saved? Now he goes on after asking those questions to ask more. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? And so this is what was going on there. They were, after having begun by grace, they were re-entering into the works of the Old Testament and the Jewish law. Not as not saying that a Jewish person can't keep kosher if they want to. It's healthier for you. I know that. But as a means of salvation, as a means of being holy, they were re-entering in these other things. And they were going aside. And Paul is saying, hey, are you foolish? I can't imagine many pastors from the pulpit just asking their congregation, are you guys being dummies? But that's what Paul is doing here. But I do hope that as we go through Scripture, you double-check and ask yourself the same questions that Paul is asking the Galatians. Paul is willing to be bold here, and sometimes that's what it takes when we're talking about accountability. We're talking about telling somebody something a little uncomfortable. But Paul here, he wasn't concerned about, you know, oh no, the tithe money is going to go down when I send them this letter. Because that wasn't what was important to them. Oh no, their happiness might go down, because holiness was more important. And yes, he did support, you know, he says, don't muzzle the ox. He quoted from the Old Testament. He does support supporting the church. But at the end of the day, he wasn't going to arrange his message in such a way that he got more money. And we unfortunately see that today. And he wasn't going to arrange his message in such a way that it made people like him more, or that he was going to be super popular. He wanted to tell them the truth because he wanted them prepared for the next life. And he wanted them prepared to live the Christian life in this world and be effective ministers here. Not just happy, not just sitting in a pew and taken care of. And so that sometimes that means he needed to rock the boat a little. Let's look at Galatians 2, 1. 
And he's kind of summarized his life, and, and uh, he's, we won't get into Galatians 1 very much, but he's in, introduced everything, and he's, he's getting to his point. And so Galatians 2, 1 says, Then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. It was because of a revelation that I went up, and I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. But I did so in private for those who were of reputation, to those who were of reputation, for fear that I might be running, or had run, in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So again, this is a hint on what Paul is actually correcting them on here. Uh, And he's telling him, hey, I went humbly, I went and I looked at the other apostles. So what I'm about to say to you is not something new, or it's not something just for me. This is the way Christianity is. There's some accountability here, even for Paul, saying, hey, I got some accountability to make sure I wasn't off on my own or doing things wild. That's why we send ministers to seminaries. That's why we train them. That's why we have discipleship programs, even to this day. And he's saying, hey, I wanted to double check that what I was telling the the Gentile Christians, hey, that was the same thing that the the essentially uh, Jewish-focused leadership in Jerusalem at the time would have been telling them. And so even with Titus, who is a Gentile or a Greek, they didn't make him get circumcised. So we know here in Galatians there was people that were telling folks, you have to do these aspects of the law. They were called Judaizers. You have to do these things to be saved or to get things added. You know, you need to stay saved or it builds on your salvation somehow. But that's not what he was... That's not what he was telling. He was not, that's not what he was teaching, and that's not what the Bible taught. It is grace through faith. It is not a, a works thing. Our works should flow out of being saved, but our works themselves don't add anything to our salvation or couldn't save us. Isaiah 64, I believe it's verse 4, actually uses the phrase, our works are filthy rags. And we sometimes we mute things or we nerf them. I don't know if you guys know what nerf means. Nerf is those, those fun little toys, you know, with the soft darts. Nerf can also be a verb meaning to soften things. So when you nerf something, you kind of take off the hard edges. Well, guys, in the original Hebrew there, that says our, our works, the best that we can produce, they're just as good as used minstrel rags. And don't get on to me for being gross. That's what Scripture compares our works to. So I don't want to add those things onto what Jesus did on the cross. Wouldn't that be offensive? And so in the original language, it comes across a little more bluntly and boldly. But that's the idea. And Paul is dealing with this here in Galatia. Continuing on. Uh, And this is actually verse 4. I'm sorry for the little typo there. It says 14. This is actually verse 4. But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, that is our freedom, our freedom to do good works, our freedom to live and walk in Christ, our freedom from trying to save ourselves. Liberty which we have in Christ Jesus in order to bring us into bondage. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. But from those who were of high reputation... What they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. So he said, hey, the apostles, they didn't add anything to me. They, we were on the same page. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, for he, was effectually worked, for he who effectually worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles, that he there, the Holy Spirit, that is God, working through them. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to them circumcised. They only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I also was eager to do. So, hey, we're on the same page. Paul's continuing that. He's letting everybody know we're on the same page because he's setting up his response and his time that he had to call somebody out, a Christian brother, a Christian leader, and hold them accountable for falling into bad ideas. Galatians 2.11 says, but when Cyphus came, that's Peter, to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Now note, he stood condemned, not I got onto him because I didn't like him. There was not some weird rivalry here. We are a united team as Christians. We should be working together to glorify God. That wasn't what was going on. And I also got to note that Our Catholic friends claim that Peter was the first pope. 
even though uh, the, the first bishop of Rome and those kinds of things, those terms didn't show up till later, and they were all seen as equal, even in, um, oh, I just forgot, the, one of the church councils, the Council of Nicaea, uh, which is where they, they really dealt with heresy, and they said, no, you guys over here can't throw in these extra books, and they dealt with some of these other things. Even at that, the Pope didn't preside over that. Rome sent two bishops, two pastors, just like everybody else, and everybody was on the same page. So that idea came much later. But they'll tell me, our Catholic friends will tell me, that Peter is the first pope. Uh, he could have had papal infallibility. And I don't see that in this passage, do you? And I don't see it in the remainder of this passage. They believe that the pope is the vicar or representative of Christ, and that he has the ability to speak ex cathedra with authority. And so they trust not only what the Bible says, but also church tradition. And the church translation, or I shouldn't say in translation, church interpretation of the Bible trumps whatever we seem to think it reads. And they think they can count on the Pope. Uh, they, they trust that too. But as I drill down, as I talk to them about verses like that, some of my Catholic friends have said, well, that's, that's only when he's speaking as Pope and the office of Pope. And, as, and when he's speaking perfectly, and you keep drilling down, well, what about this other time in history? Well, sometimes bishops have to correct them. And, and, you, and so wait a minute. It boils down to you're saying that the Pope speaks perfectly when he speaks perfectly. That's like saying, I take a hundred, I, I win a hundred, um, I perfectly make a hundred baskets of the baskets I actually make it in, right? Like if I'm shooting basketball, I'm not counting those two or three that missed. Out of the ones that made it in, I made a hundred percent of those. It doesn't make sense. It's almost what we call tautology. It is, that means it, it doesn't really say anything. It has no meaning because they have to put all these layers because deep down I think they know, as we know, People are flawed and imperfect, including Peter. Peter is going to affirm Paul as Scripture in 2 Peter, right? So that would be later. Paul, Peter affirms Scripture that calls, calls him out, because Galatians would have already been written. And he also affirms Scripture where Jesus, where God himself, God in the flesh, says, get behind me, Satan. So Peter knew that he had a problem. Peter knew that he wasn't perfect and didn't pretend to be. He didn't let people bow down or kiss his ring. or any, He didn't let any of them do anything like that. He was a humble person. He was a fisherman who was used by God and became a great teacher. But I had to pause and go on this, this thing here because this is one of those scriptural defeaters to that idea. And if Peter was the first pope, there would have been a, a much bigger problem going on here. But Paul continues... Galatians 2.12, for prior to the coming of certain men from James, that's the half-brother of Jesus, and this doesn't appear to be a reflection on James, this is a reflection on the men that came from Jerusalem, who James took over as senior pastor there. He used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he began to withdraw and, told, and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision, those that are demanding that he get circumcised, or that everybody needs to get circumcised. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cyphus, in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. And so this is a little complex to understand, but the idea here that he's getting into is that the Jewish law would have said you can't eat with unclean people or eat, and you can't hang out with these un uncircumcised people. You need to separate yourself from them. And yet as Christians, they were uniting together with these people. So it wasn't a matter of, hey, if you want to eat kosher, that's fine. But you can't pretend that the people who are not, that are Gentiles, are second-class Christians and that you know, they need to eat down the hall. Okay, so Paul was fighting against any type of segregation here or second-class citizen in the kingdom of heaven. And so he continues on. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. But if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. I had this really deep voice seminary professor as we would go through uh, books like this in Romans. He would just say, may it never be very deeply. And I could hear it echoing in my head. For if I rebuild what I've once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. 
For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. You see, the idea is that the law lets us know that we need a Savior, but the law itself is not our Savior and cannot possibly produce righteousness. And after Jesus filled in the law for us, the true law, not all those extra added on stuff that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all these commentaries, they would ultimately become like things like the Talmud. Not all those things that were added on extra. No, Jesus fulfilled the actual biblical law for us. He filled it in like a kid colors in a, a picture with crayon. It's fulfilled. It's done. Right? It, it still has a purpose in that it can show us our need for a Savior, but we are not to try to do it ourselves, and we can't add anything to it at all. And so Paul is calling them out. If we try to then go back to the law after being saved, it's not eating with unclean people that is sinful then. What's sinful then is this gross division and trying to add something to Christ's righteousness by what we do. That's the sin that Peter is committing. And this is an important issue for him to get because it's dividing the newfound Christian community. So in Galatians 2.20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. He goes on a little bit further and says, if, if works can make you holy then why did Jesus need to die? If you doing work can make you holy, then why did Jesus need to die for you? Our works, our love should be response to his love, not something that makes us puff up our chest and think that we're better than anybody else. Philippians 1.6 says something similar. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will be perfect, will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. I started to sing the song that we sometimes sing instead of the way that the NASB translate it. He's going to be faithful to complete what he started in you. And that's who we turn to. We don't try in our own methods. We, we recognize, hey, God, I need some feedback. Hey, God, I need, not feedback, I need some instruction. I need some command. I need you to recognize where the sin is in my life and point me in that direction and help me to change it. Because on my own power, I just keep doing it again. But I need the Holy Spirit to empower me be able to set it aside. Uh, so Paul was willing to even tell Peter off, and that was very important. I mentioned uh, 2 Peter 3.16. Uh, he would call Paul's letters Scripture. So this was not something that Peter disagreed with. Peter apparently repented of this and recognized, yeah, I'm, I'm creating a division here. I'm wrong. So we need to be teachable. And I want to point out why this is so important. You guys might not know who this face is. But in the early hours of March 13th, 1964, 28-year-old Kitty uh, Genovese, and I'm not, I'm maybe saying that name wrong, was stabbed outside the apartment building across the street from where she lived in an apartment above a row of shops on Austin Street in Queens, New York. Two weeks after the, the murder, New York Times published an article claiming that 38 witnesses saw or heard the attack, but none of them called the police or came to her aid. This incident prompted inquiries into what became known as the bystander effect. So if we see somebody in trouble, and that would be a part of holding someone accountable, they're doing something wrong, that's going to cause harm, and we do nothing, what happens to them? Sin continues in their life, and maybe they find themselves destroyed by it. As this lady stood by, or this lady was victim, victimized as other people stood by and didn't respond because they thought somebody else would do it. They didn't handle it the way they were supposed to. So let's look at how we're supposed to handle accountability biblically in Matthew 18. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the ch even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. That means kick him out, but in the hopes that as they're out in the world that they will return. Right? You need to witness to a Gentile and a tax collector. Right? Now, notice what Jesus didn't say. He didn't say blast them on social media. He didn't say do vague booking. If you guys know what that means, it's making this kind of indirect post on Facebook about things that are going on in your life or in somebody else's life. You're kind of making little vague snipes. Don't do that. None of that stuff. He didn't even say, go and tell your pastor so-and-so is sinning. What did he say? Go to them. 
No gossipy stuff, none of that. Go to the person. So if you see somebody who's having an issue, go. And the reason this came up now is because all these riots started with one incident where one man was murdered. And as a juvenile justice officer, I knew how to do that restraint. And there were times when I was working inside of a locked facility that even if they were senior to me in terms maybe of rank or maybe in terms of they had been there longer than me, if somebody was doing something wrong, I had to call them out and say, eh, you guys can't do that. Now maybe I'm not have said at, eh, I would have gone with kind of my hat in my hand. But there was a time that I was not the supervisor, but I had to shut down the facility and say, you're my supervisor, we need to do this, let's do this because they were missing something that was very important. And that led to a confession of somebody having been on drugs. In fact, really fun story, that led to a confession uh, that, they had a, that they did drugs while on pass, even though I had a negative drug test from them. They didn't know it was negative. So that was really fun. But you have to do that. And so right there, the world has now been thrown into riots when there was other officers around this officer who was down on that man's neck using an improper restraint and then even passed when he's passed out and stayed there. The world would be different today if some of those other men held him accountable in the moment and said, whoa, off him. Now, they wanted to have a united front, and I understand that. When at all possible, you do this in private, but sometimes it's important enough that you got to say, let's stop, let's do this, or let's switch. But everyone else was afraid, and they were silent. And so that man died. And then now there are riots that have cost way more lives because there wasn't accountability. So I'm for accountability. I'm for cameras. I'm for those things for our police officers. But I also want to make sure that this is a spiritual thing. I'm for accountability here. Proverbs 13, 18 says, pro, 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 ugh, I can't talk, I'm sorry. Uh, Proverbs 13, 18, poverty and shame will come to him and he neglects discipline. But he who regards reproof will be honored. We talk about being a Berean in this church. So whether it's me or some other teacher, if somebody goes off the rails, we want you to look into your Bible and know. And we want to talk about Scripture and go, hey, you said this. Have you considered this verse? There's a way to do it where you can ask some questions. There's a way to do it where you can be kind about it. But at the end of the day, we need to hold each other accountable. And when people are in sin, we need to be able to say, hey, you're in sin. You need to cut that out. If somebody comes up to me and they want to be members inside the church and they're, you know, they're, they're living together or they're, they're on drugs right at that moment, we're going to talk, we're going to pray, right? We're going to do some of those things because we need accountability. Too often, kind of tied into last week, we get this pushback, don't judge me. But remember, it's how we judge. It's how we communicate. We do have to notice these things. We can't, as Christians, set silently and allow everyone else to go off the rails. So you need some accountability. Well, start at home. Start with your parents. Start with your spouse. Your spouse, you should be able to have honest conversations with each other about what you guys are doing right or wrong. Start with a small group, or go to a small group from that, a smaller group of Christians, and have Christian mentors. Everybody should kind of have the Paul to their Timothy, right? as well as their own Timothy. Everybody should have somebody that they could look up to and talk to and go, am I doing something wrong here? Check me. Let me know if I'm off. And if we don't have those things, if we're not taking any feedback, if we think we have it all figured out and we're marching forward, not listening to anybody, well, I'm going to paraphrase here, and I don't even remember where the quote's from. Fools think they have everything figured out, but smart people are humble and listen, trying to learn from everyone. And so that's what we should do, is be patient and try to learn. As Chuck makes his way back up here for a closing hymn, let's close in prayer. Dear Father, we know that in our own life we sometimes mess up. And so we ask, or at least I ask, and I hope everyone can personalize this along with me, that you bring good, faithful brothers and sisters in our life that we love and can hear from and them say, hey, I'm worried about you. I saw you do this. Are you really doing that? Can we talk about it? Whatever way would be most effective to recorrecting us and putting us back on the right path. And Lord, let us continue to be a church that will call sin, sin, so that people will know that it's sin, so that they cannot be consumed by it, but instead be faced with the reality and the opportunity to turn to you and away from it. 
and let that continue in our small groups and things like that as well. And in the church in America in general, our, our, our local churches, but just beyond, beyond that, Lord. Help Christians call people out for sin in an appropriate and loving way, in a personal one-on-one way, when how possible, so that we can turn and be more holy and be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.